teach us you know, join us with the other share just uh, your your fuzzy or you just wipe your camera it's a bit it's not clear there we go that's it sorry right. Damon. just uh one thing kev i just want to do dedications give me one second uh Okay, so I want to do the shir uh, in the refu of Chaya uh, Meira Basmolka, uh, Sarah Masha, uh, uh, Sarah Masha, sorry, Leia Masha Basara, and then Simcha Resra Ben Rus, and uh, Yaakov Tov Ben Giladina, um, and all the Cholim of Tal Israel go for it, Kevin. Okay, so this this week is double parsha, Chukat Balak. So in in, in uh, the the word chukat is comes from the word the word chok comes from the word chukat which is plural of of chok which is something that we just need to do and we can't we don't understand it it's something that uh, we commanded to do and we can't question it we can't understand there's no rational understanding for instance the what's discussed at the beginning of the parsha is the red heifer and the red heifer has to be, it can't even have one hair that's a different color. Otherwise, it's not, we can't use it and it's used to purify uh, someone who is impure. Another example is shutness, wool and linen. It just says we can't mix wool and linen or different species together. There's no reason. We have to just do it. End of story. So this is what uh, this parasha is about. And um, yeah. It's uh, so it's, it's just having faith, and at the end of the day, we can we can question why does the sun rise in the east? Why is the sky blue? Why is there a moon? We can we can have we can ask a million questions, but we won't find the answers. So we have to just accept it. It's just it's part of uh, um, uh, the uh, avoda and our religion and our faith. We have to we just got to accept it and move on. Otherwise, you can get frustrated. And uh, some people uh, drop out of Yiddishkeit because they can't find answers to every single thing, and it's, it's just impossible. It's, uh, there's infinite things in the in 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 the world that we just don't have answers to, and uh, this is an example of one of them. Yeah. So there's three. Okay. Uh, and what's interesting? Sorry, Karen. Yeah, Art, what were you gonna say? What's interesting? No, what's interesting about the wool and the shot, uh, the wool and the linen, uh, the two things they found out in spacesuits. If you mix them together, there's never an airtight seal. But the moment you separate them, and the kosher, the the, the astronaut suit is uh, actually airproof. Did you know that? Oh uh, yes, yes, I remember when they had yeah. the Challenger that went up. Yeah. 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 Okay. Interesting. I don't know why, just that's how it is. <laughs> okay. So, uh, Rav Simpson Rafael Hirsch was discussing there are three categories. There's Mishpatim, Chukim, and Mitzvot. And as Kevin said, uh, Chukim are the least understood, but we have to follow them anyway. We, um, it's, it's obviously beyond our intellect. But even the other Mitzvahs, although we're given certain assigned reasons, there's obviously levels beyond our country. Tension. It's just that we have to use our logic as much as possible to learn the depths of the mitzvahs within our capabilities. And that's obviously what gets discussed in the Gemara. I'm going to send a new link, Gav, you and I will chat a little later. And uh, we'll get started uh, now. And then tomorrow at 5.30, it'll be enough time with Ravonia with your group, Gav. Tomorrow so, at 5.30, 5.45. Yeah, because I might have yeah, a student. Uh, actually, wait a minute. Wait a minute, five thirty. No, wait a minute. My lesson starts at five thirty. I'll have to just check with him. I said to him, I'll, I'll send the message to the dad. So I asked him if we could have it earlier. I'll send the message. Okay. Well, let, let us know in the group. Anyway, let's send a new share and actually yeah. do a share, not a share about the share, and then you'll let us know in the WhatsApp group, Kev. Thanks, man. Yeah. All right. So, guys, it was a very, very simple principle that we had. Four bullet points. That's all it was. The first a discussion by Rava was a case where um, the reason why the son doesn't have, the, have to pay the one-fifth surcharge for his false oath is because when he inherited this pouch, he didn't realize that his father stole a diamond and was stuck in the pouch. So he said, I don't have it. 
when he found it and he said he had it, at that point, uh, it wasn't a false oath because he believed what he said. So there's no issue as far as that's concerned. Then we learned this Mishnah's case of except for less than a putter's worth of the principal, meaning that either the thief paid the um, uh, um, pay, paid or the victim forgave him of all the greater amounts. So either way. But what was remaining was less than a putter. So the bottom line is Rav Papa said that he was talking about an issue of um, what he, uh, appreciation, not depreciation. And then the Gemara goes into depreciation. So Rav Papa said that taught us only regarding a case where the robbed item is no longer in existence. But if the robbed item is still in existence, the robber's possession, and it's less of a, a value of a putter, he has to pursue the victim even for a faraway land to return it because he can't bring an ashram offering for atonement to Hashem or for a false oath unless he's actually returned uh, uh, the principle. That's the uh, bottom line. So what the first injunction was, was that we were worried that eventually its value would increase to that of a prutta, at which case it would become a legal obligation. And then retroactively, if you bought your ashram offering, you've uh, it, it's uh, it's null and void. It's a problem. So that was the first statement brought that Rav Papa said. The second statement was there's a group of Talmudim that learned the opposite. That Rav Papa said, listen, you're not going to have to worry about the value eventually increasing to a putter from being less than a putter, because it doesn't make a difference whether the robbed item exists or doesn't exist. Basically, if it's worth under putter, it's not going to go uh, to more than a putter. Obviously, it's not living in the 21st century. You go every day to pick and pay, and it goes up by putter a day. But in those days, things seem to be more economically stable. So uh, uh, you can bring the ashram offering, even if the principle remains outstanding, at less than a putter's worth, because if it doesn't trigger a legal case, you can bring your, offer, uh, um, your ashram offering as a false oath to Hashem, because they're two separate issues. Okay, then we learned this other case where, about Rava, because remember, Rava is not a Tana. Uh, he's an Amoira. Rava is a Tana, and Shmuel is a Tana. Rava is an Amoira, which means he goes under Rav. Okay? There's a lot of noise in the background, excuse me. Okay. So, all right, guys, bottom line. So, we said yesterday, just in summary, there were three bundles that were valued at three prutas. Their value decreased and stood currently at two prutas. The thief returned two of the bundles to his victim. He's still liable. Uh, we want to know, is he still liable to return the other one? Why? Because if he returned more than a prutta, which is two out of the three, which is definitely more than a prutta, then he's fulfilled his legal obligation. If less than a putter remains, then he the court can't extract it from him. So we want to know what's the story. Okay, that's uh, the, the bottom line. So we said, look, what's this even based on? So we said that, that if it was worth three putters before, and now it's decreased to two putters, because at the time of theft, it was worth three putters then, if you deliver two out of the three, you're retaining a putter's worth of value by the standards of the timeline of when the theft took place, and therefore the court can induce to return it. There's certainly no problem there. Obviously, if the current value is more than a putter, there's no question you can retain it. So we want to know where Rava got support from this, what do you call it, uh, prehistory of the value in order to um, attach goods from the sheriff of the court. So we learned in 96P um, that if a Jew stole chametz and the period of Pesach passed over it while in his possession, that chametz is worthless. worthless. But he's still got the Sheva's regal intact, so he can say to the owner, behold that which is yours is right before you take it back as it is. So we say kind of like how is this fair because it's worthless now. No Jew can use it. It's it's It's... It's basically labeled as um, asur, which means prohibited by uh, for benefit. So you can't sell it, use it, etc. So the original owner is actually kind of had a bit of a loss, but the, 
Or the court can say, look, you took the bottle of Shemus Regal, here's your bottle back. That's all it can say. Hashem will hold him responsible. Don't worry about that. But if for some reason he had took a couple of swigs of the bottle and he broke it in his drunk state, <laughs> he has to give the original owner of the Shemus Regal back the cash equivalent at the value of when he stole it. Now it's worth real money at that point uh, if it's no longer in existence. So on that basis, we say, listen, that's the timeline of the theft. It had monetary value there. That's how we have to work an equation if it's no longer in existence. It's the same thing that if you steal three bundles that were with three prutta, they're now with two prutta, they were with three, he gave away two out of the three, the court can force him to take the last bundle or give the put equivalent in cash because that was it was worth at the time of theft. So we're basing it on the previous mission. The mission now is 103. The mission then was 98. Okay. Then we dealt with this case of two bundles. So rather same, same. We also bring a lesson from Rabbi. He said, look, thief stole two bundles. Together they were valued at a putter. And he returned one of them to the victim. What's the law? So you can either say, as of now, there's no robbed item of value in his possession because the remaining bundle uh, is not worth the putter. That's the bottom line. That's the one way to say it. And therefore, he's not liable to return it, Brendan. That's what I'm saying. Or perhaps you can say, why did he not return the robbed item that was in his possession? Because basically, since the bundle he gave uh, back is worth less than a putter, he hasn't legally returned any to the owner and he remains obligated to give the second bundle. I want to know how does the court actually work this? So after raising the query, rather resolved it and he said, listen, there's no robbed item here and there's no return here. In other words, rather saying two things. Since less than a putter's worth of the robbed item remains, the thief is no longer in violation. Nothing the court can do. But saying another thing, since the court well, since the thief did not return a putter's worth to the owner, he remains subject to the requirement to return stolen property. Okay, so it's a bit of a catch-22. So the Gemara says on this, what are you talking about? If there's no robbed item here, there's no return here. Meaning, if the thief is no longer considered in violation, how can the obligation to return stolen property still rest upon him, at least from a legal standpoint? I learned to give a shoe in the morning. Okay. <laughs> so we're saying, well, there's no legal standpoint. So the Kamara says, all right, let's clear it up in terms of what Rob is saying. Even though there's no robbed item here, there's no fulfillment here of the mitzvah to return the robbed item. In other words, although there's nothing of value that remains in the thief's possession and under monetary law, he can't be sued for the return of the remaining bundle. Still, in Shemaim, has not fulfilled the mitzvah of return in stolen property since he gave back the owner nothing of value. So in order to discharge the mitzvah that the Torah placed upon him, he must retain the uh, remaining bundle to the victim, even though the court cannot invoke uh, um, any attachment of goods. Okay. So, fine. Then Rava said that this has a very, very similar... Jesus, guys, just give me a second. Okay. So what we are saying here, Kev, is there's this concept that was put to mirror this this uh, issue of the two bundles. And we're saying, Rava said, listen, you've got a case of a Nazir, because you must remember that this case of a Nazir it's in Numbers chapter 6, verse 1 to 21, I think. 1 to 21 to 21, somewhere around there. But you can check it out. If you've got a vow of uh, Nazarus, basically you can't cut your hair, you can't drink wine, and you can't become contaminated from a corpse for 30 days. At the end of the term, he comes to the temple, brings certain offerings, shaves his hair, etc. Okay? So there's a specific Nagayim, chapter 14, verse 4. There's a specific... Uh, um, tractate that deals with this. And Rabbi said in the Mishnah, look, you've got a Nazir. He shaves his head, leaves two hairs unshaven. He's done nothing. What has he done? He hasn't fulfilled his shaving requirement because basically, if you've got two hairs left, you haven't fulfilled the requirement. So then Rabbi says, okay, 
So after leaving the two heads, he shaved one of them and the other one fell out on its own. What's the law? Has he now fulfilled the shaving requirement? In other words, shaving less than two hairs doesn't constitute an act of shaving, luckily. So Rava therefore inquires, do we say that since the second shaving was done to a single hair, it's not really deemed an act of halakhic shaving. The requirement remains unfulfilled. Or you can say that since the last hair ultimately fell out and nothing remains, the nazir is no longer subject to the shaving requirement. Okay? So this, this was a question for Rava. What's the law? Is he fulfilled his shaving requirement or what? But there wasn't an issue for Rav Acha of Defti because he said to Rabba, uh, sorry, he said to Ravina, I don't understand why Rav is in doubt about the law of Nazir who shaved his head one hair at a time. Because we learned that a Nazir that uh, basically does one hair at a time has discharged his obligation because the fact of it is how you get through any task, whether it's harvesting or cutting of a hair or eating, is one spoon at a time, guys. That's it. So there's no question that if a Nazir shaved his entire head, one hair at a time, eventually he'll fulfill his obligation because the shaving of each individual hair is combined with the shaving of others, etc., etc. So, like, what's the story? So Ravina explains to Rav Achi of Difti that there's more to this than that. He said, look, um, he said to Rav Acha, he said, listen, Rav's inquiry is a little bit more specific. It's regarding a case where the first one of the two hairs fell out. Now that's a problem because then the Nazir shaved the last remaining one, okay? So when he began shaving his, uh, doing the second shaving of his head, his head didn't contain the minimum numbers of hairs that can be halakhically regarded as a shaving, uh, according to Rashi. Okay. And that's the problem. It's not if the uh, hair fell out last because you've done what you've done. So now, do we say as of now, there's no longer the amount of unshaved hair that invalidates a head shaving and is therefore exempt from any further action? Okay. Because since there are not two hairs remaining on the Nazis here, he's not unshaved, technically. Okay. Although he was initially subject to the shaving requirement and never shaved his head properly at the time, his current status, guys, is one of baldness. Okay. So he doesn't need to be shaved anymore. Okay. So it's impossible for him to shave with the one solitary, lonely hair there. So even if he gets rid of it, it might not be halakhically a shaving, but there ain't any more hair. Or perhaps we say that it's not considered a proper shaving because when he initially shaved two hairs behind so that his head remained legally halakhically unshaved, and now then he shaved a second time, there were not two hairs remaining because the second to last hair fell out. So his current action does not qualify as a shaving. Therefore, he can't discharge his obligation until his hair grows back and shaves it properly. Uh, there's a question. So Gavin asked a good question yesterday. He says, well, are we talking about one shaving? So Gavin, no. We're talking about the fact that there's an initial shaving done and then there's a ritual shaving at the end. There's a practical shaving, so it doesn't look like the wild man from Borneo. And the other one is a ritual halachic shaving, which is done... I don't know if it's done with witnesses or not. I have no idea. So we're saying if there's no ritual shaving of a minimum of two hairs, does that occur halakhically? But then practically the oak sport, so the goal achieved. So how do we look at this? So after raising the inquiry, rather resolved it. He said, listen, there's no hair here and there's no shaving here. <laughs> okay. No, I'm sorry. I'm, I shouldn't be. Uh, so Damon, basically talking. it's hair on it's hair on there. It's here nor there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So exactly yeah. there. Kevin, huh? Kevin, you should enjoy that one. Eh? Well done, Arthur. So, so exactly that, Arthur. Robert seems to be saying two things, exactly like before. Since there's less than two hairs remaining on the Nazi's head, he's no longer considered unshaved. But since the Nazi did not perform a proper halakhic shaving, he remains subject to the requirement. So the Gemara says, I don't know. I don't get this. It's a self-contradictory uh, statement. What does it mean? If there's no hair here, there's a shaving here. You know, saying like, what gives? So Rabbi's defining it. He says, look, even though there's no hair here, there's no fulfillment here of the mitzvah to shave. Mm -hmm. Okay. So all it's saying is that although the Nazir cannot be termed unshaven because he's bald, he's failed to fulfill the mitzvah of a lachic shaving on his head. Now, again, 
The Minchas Chinuch says he has to wait uh, uh, and for his hair to regrow and shave it in order to discharge his obligation. So there goes the 30 goal Nazir discharging obligation goal. But the Rambam says it's unnecessary. The guy's bald. He's bald. So, okay, that's how we end off that. Now, we're dealing with the third issue that's very, very similar. And that's an issue about the law of tumor transmission. So let me just explain to you. Well, I, I'm, guys, you know this, but I'm explaining it for Brendan's benefit. Because if he can tolerate my share, he's entitled to a decent explanation. It means he's a tzaddik. We know you guys are tzaddik. All right. So in Numbers chapter 19, verse 14, Brendan, when a corpse is under a roof, its spiritual impurity, which is known as tuma, is transmitted to anything else under that roof. Okay. Now, the tumor does not pass through the roof to objects on an upper second floor story, unless there's an opening such as a skylight uh, between the levels of at least one tefach square between the stories. Okay. So, if there's like a skylight, but it's sealed shut with an item that does not contract tumor, that item works as a barrier and it prevents the tumor from passing from the lower story to the upper story. You get that? Mm. Okay, good. Guys, you get that? Yeah. Kev, you and Arthur 100%? Yeah, but so it passes what? It, 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 it gets trapped. And, it and because of the barrier, it can't go through. Yeah. Basically, that's what he's saying. Yeah, yeah. So in other words, well, if, it's not there's, permissible. if there's a tefach, it can go from the uh, story at which the corpse is there on the first floor, and it can go to the second floor. If you block it up, uh, or there's, there's a it's a barrier, the tumor doesn't uh, uh, contract and infect the walls of the secondary story. Okay, that's all. It's, it's pretty straightforward. You can look it up in Numbers chapter 19, verse 14. It, it actually makes sense, Darren, because let's say you were in a house and there was tumor in your house. What about the side walls? It means it would go through the side walls and take somebody else's house, which in those days things were joined. Well, flats are joined. It's a good point. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So, I mean, you can't have it uh, traveling through everything. Wouldn't make sense. Yeah, exactly. So, so but generally, Gavin learned with Rabbi Zolta. By the way, uh, Brendan, one of the things in your conversion is numbers. I've gave it to you in English. It's Bab Midbar, which means in the desert. Oh, that's yeah. the Hebrew word for it. Okay. So, uh, Arthur's right is that. Uh, you know, when you've got inf um, when you have inf uh, infections and etc., and how does it travel between issues? But Gavin listened to a share of tumor for a Cohen uh, and uh, how it affects trees and other things when you're going to the cemetery. So, bottom line, guys, is that it travels a little bit different to how you can imagine a fumigation of poison that's able, it's a little different. Uh, there are halakhic differences that create. Uh, it's not it's, you can't think of it like a chemical intrusion. Mm -hmm. But but let's just go to a separate part. Now that we've done by mid by numbers, we're going to go to Vayikra Leviticus, here chapter eleven, verse thirty-three, and it, now the Torah discusses that uh, Kevin, if you've got an earthenware vessel, okay, think of it like a vase. It contracts tumor. If it's if it's face down and the opening is there, it becomes then a conduit for accepting tumor upwards. If you've got the vase upside That's, down, uh, don't okay. you have to smash it? And also, if a, if a shear falls into it, you have to Absolutely. smash it. Absolutely. But what I'm saying is, here, yeah, if the vase is up or upwards, it doesn't contract tumor on the exterior. It only contracts tumor through uh, impurity through its cavity. Hmm. Not through the exterior. It's important to bear this in mind. And if, it's, so, and if it's upside down, it doesn't get the cavity or the exterior, no? No, if it's upside down, it's going to get tumor because the hole is... never thought I'd need this. Yeah, the hole is this way. Yes, correct. So it does create tumor when it goes up. The whole thing becomes infected. You have to smash it. Okay. Uh, so the whole thing gets tumor if it's upside down. If it's the other way around, just the inside gets tumor. No, it doesn't because tumor goes upwards. So there's no tumor. There's no tumor. It's not. 
That's okay. what I'm saying. Yeah, it's you. not like uh, nox it's not like toxic gases. Do you get what I'm saying? It works differently. And it doesn't get yeah. by the exterior. The exterior doesn't allow for internal tumor of the object. It doesn't become a vessel, a conduit for tumor. So what we are saying is here is that you've got a scarlet and you decide to trap it with a vase. Okay. If you trap it like this, you're not doing anything because then that entrapment that's meant to be a barrier is tumor itself. Then it goes from the first floor to the second floor. But assuming that the cup is upwards or the vase is upwards with a hole in the top, then you can use that to block the equivalent of a tefach to prevent the tumor going from the first floor to the second floor. Okay? But it has to be with a hole towards the top. Now, if that's the case, um, you, you, can, you, can, you can deal with it. In other words, it follows that if you place an earthenware barrel in a uh, skylight or some hole facing upwards between the bottom floor and the next floor, and the exterior faces the ground floor, it's sealed and you seal it around with clay. Corpse tumor can't affect the exterior of the vessel and it can't pass upwards through the skylight because the vessel itself doesn't contract tumor. But if the barrel develops a hole, or the vessel from the bottom, like uh, a crack or whatever, tumor can still enter the barrel's interior through the hole and renders it tumor, impure. So, and it makes it um, unfit to prevent tumor from passing through the skylight to the upper floor. So what we are so, saying is, all right, this is the point. It has to be, uh, if it's a tefach, if it's a tefach, it can create a, a enough of a opening where tumor impurity can go from the first floor to the upper floor. But if it's less than the tefach, um, we want to know, even if this hole is less than the tefach, does it enable the barrel itself to become contaminated, cancelling its capacity to seal off the uh, skylight? So in other words, do we view the skylight as completely open so that the tumor passes through its one tefach square opening to the upper story? Okay, so we're going to see what happens if you seal half the hole and half the hole. Okay, so I'm going to go through it, but as long as you've got the background. So Rabbi said, listen, the rabbis discussed in a Mishnah, and that was in Kalim, Kalim means vessels, uh, chapter 10, verse 6. And it says, an earthenware barrel that had been placed in the skylight developed a hole and sediment sealed it. The sediment spared it from contracting tumor and from allowing corpse tumor to pass through to it to the upper story. Okay? So in other words, the hole in the barrel is considered properly sealed by the sediments or the clay or whatever you do. And tumor doesn't enter the barrel's interior through the hole and contaminate the barrel. So the barrel remains fit to prevent the passage of tumor through the scarlet. In other words, it's a good enough barrier to the conduit. So we see from this Mishnah that an earthenware barrel is considered repaired with respect to the lure of Tumah by means of just a mere adhesion stuffing its hole. And you don't have to permanently repair it in a kiln. In other words, you don't have to uh, redo it. You can just uh, have a temporary cork or, or, or clay or whatever to, um, uh, to prevent it from going through. So this is what's going to set the ensuing inquiry. So Rav inquired, if one sealed half the hole, what is the law? Now you're going to start to see where the argument's going to come up to the Prutta and the Nazi. We're back to the same argument. If the hole was originally large enough, guys, this is very important. If you don't listen to anything else, please listen to this. Uh, if Damon, the hole sorry, just... Sealed, okay. Yeah? You had a cup. If the cup is facing upwards, it's over, does the tumor go in that way? Or if it's facing down, it goes through? Okay, so... It goes uh, upwards. It, Basically, it goes upwards. There has to be a barrier uh, at the bottom because the minute, in other words, I'm going to show you again. Here's a cup. <laughs> All I've done is drop water on me the whole time. But you see the bottom here. Tumor can enter through upwards. This whole vessel becomes contaminated. So it can't be used as a barrier between the second floor and the first floor. If the cup is used as a, a stopper, of the hole. It's got to be up where the hole is upwards because no tumor can reach an exterior. Okay? Ah, okay. okay. And because no tumor can reach an exterior, we say, what if there's a crack at the bottom? 
Now, if this is one tefach, and the one tefach goes through, it's a problem because that allows tumor. So Rav is going to ask, what if we seal half of it? So this is where the argument's going to come through. Listen carefully. You'll see it mimic the nazir, the uh, uh, the bundles, the prutta, etc. If the hole was originally large enough for tumor to pass through it into the barrel, and one sealed off half of it with clay, what's the law? Do we say that the remaining hole is too small for tumor to pass through it, and the barrel is again immune to tumor? Because if you remember that... Uh, uh, basically, you need a tefach to pass through. So if you're saying you sealed it with half a tefach, now tuma can't technically pass through because it's less than the minimum allowance to allow the impurity to pass through. So do we say that's good enough? And and sealing of half of it with clay uh, protects it from absorbing tuma from the first level uh, uh, ground floor to the second level? Or do we say that since the hole was originally large enough and has not been sealed completely, okay, then it's considered open and tumor does pass through it. So it's the whole argument again, like the nazir and the hair. It's the yeah, exact same yeah. argument. Okay. So the Gemara uh, wonders about this inquiry. I've got nine minutes, guys. Let me just trap through it because then we got our Gemara show. Please, God, sick as well. Rav, Yaymar said to Rav Ashi, is this law not stated in our Mishnah? For we learned in the very Mishnah cited by Rav, if an earthenware barrel that has been placed in a skylight developed a hole in sediment sealed it, the sediment spared it from contracting impurity tumor and from allowing corpse tumor to pass through it to the upper story. I'll say this again. If an earthenware barrel that has been placed in a skylight developed a hole and sediment sealed it, the sediment spirit from contracting tumor and allowing corpse tumor to pass between the, the, the building levels. If the hole was not sealed by sediments, but you stuffed it with a, a plant like a vine, tumor can still pass through it unless he smears around the vine to completely seal the hole. If there were two vines stuffed in the hole, tumor passes through it and infects the second floor unless one smears clay around the sides of the vine and between one vine and the other. Now, when one does add clay, the reason the hole is considered closed is because he sealed even the most minute opening around the flower, uh, around the, uh, the container, the vine, etc., uh, etc. Et but if he did not seal these openings, the hole would not be considered closed and tumor would pass through. So we're saying, well, why is this so? If closing part of the hole suffices, because it's not a tefach big enough to allow tumor to go through, then let's say it's a case where you sealed half of it and it's too small for tumor to pass through. Clearly, you can infer from this Mishnah that if you seal the hole entirely, it's still considered open uh, unless it's in sealed from every aspect with clay and tumor continues to pass through it. So it seems as if just because it's less than a uh, it's it's less than a tefach that you've got a problem. Uh, although we said a, less than a tefach is is fine, but apparently once you have a, te a tefach, you've got to seal it completely. So the Gemara says, well, it's a, can you even use this to compare? In other words, there if you don't smear clay around the vine, it's not going to remain in the hole. In other words, your your barriers are going to just fall out from mere gravity. Because remember, it's separating the first floor from the second. So it's not deemed an effective closure because it's not permanent, guys. If you sealed half the hole with something that can remain in its place. In other words, take away the things you're stuffing it with, socks, vines, plants. For, forget about all those things. And you take the tefach and you put half a tefach of clay and it remains in its place. Since it's less than a tefach, does it prevent the tumor from going from the ground floor to the second floor? Or is it not sufficient and a partial closure is, uh, is not going to help? Um, so we want to know the answer. But unfortunately, guys, the Gomorrah says the inquiry is not resolved. Okay. So we've got six minutes left. I'm happy to end off here. I'm personally hungry. We've got uh, Rav Simcha yeah. Gemara Shir soon. I want to thank you guys for everything. Brendan, I want to thank you for talking. Damon.
And actually, my cousin from America sent me a message at six o'clock. He's visiting. He said he's in B'nai Brak, which is two k's away from here. So that's why I'm gonna. I'm going to Ramon's teach. I'll be the firmest oak in B'nai Brak, Damon. Yeah, you will Damon. be. Uh, uh, B'nai Brak is the most Haredi from place in the world. If you know Ramon's, uh, um, I said. I actually teacher, said to my cousin, I'm gonna. I'm gonna wear Ramon's. Because it's black and white, so it could be. Yeah, it that's could be, not what they mean by black and white. <laughs> Go, go no, I'm going in this shirt here. I'm going to go in this shirt here. And I'm going in jeans. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Let me see if I should come. Gavin, should I, should I put it?